Well, hello again, everyone. And for those of you who are going to tune in, uh, thanks for tuning in live. And if you're listening to this later, um, we're very glad today for our next episode of Meet the Mechonics to have uh, Stephanie Werner from the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands. And uh, she has graciously set aside an hour of her time to come in and give sort of her perspective uh, on quantum technology and where the Dutch program is going and more in general where the European Union is hopefully going uh, in this field in the next 10, 20 years. So Steph, uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for organizing all of this. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, I'm really quite happy with the number of people who have agreed to do this. So uh, hopefully it can continue and uh, people can hopefully learn a little bit more about what we're trying to build and what we're trying to spend all their money on. So first of all, I mean, generally, I, I like to, to introduce people sort of to give us sort of a bit of your background and your bio. I mean, you're an associate professor now at uh, TU Delft, um, but you, how did you sort of come into quantum technology and sort of give us a brief rundown of your CV? Yeah, so like uh, maybe I will actually start a little bit earlier, but it'll be brief. So like mm -hmm. I went to university quite late um, because actually after, after school, I, I went to work for a few years. Uh, in uh, network security, in fact. And only when I was 22, I kind of got bored with this and I decided to I guess, go to university. And, uh, and uh, initially, I didn't go to university to learn quantum, of course. In fact, when I went to university, I didn't even go there with the aim to, I don't know, do very theoretical work because what I had done for computer security is very practical and very applied. And I would say that I was even somewhat suspicious of theoretical computer science. Uh, whether that would be useful for anything. <laughs> um, of course, like, uh, I guess over time, kind of, I learned about quantum. I really started to enjoy theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then this is how I got into it. I think one of the kind of key moments is, of course, I had learned about quantum computation um, a, a little bit already. And um, so I went actually to a public lecture by John Preskill uh, uh. In, in Leiden, um, who I guess gave a much more broader perspective on, I guess, quantum computation. So not just about algorithms, of course, you know, I like algorithms, mm -hmm. um, but also kind of about quantum information, generally about quantum error correction, uh, I guess, entanglement and using entanglement, I guess, to also fight entanglement or noise. Um, uh, so that really fascinated me. And I kind of decided to, I guess, embark on, uh, on the quantum tour. Um, and I've been doing this ever since. <laughs> And you come in from the theory side, right? You're, you're a dedicated right. theorist in this. That's right. I am a, I'm a hardcore theorist. <laughs> and so what do you focus on specifically? I mean, we've had people, um, you know, Austin Fowler, who does the stuff on error correction, Mark Everett, who's sort of more foundational, um, some condensed matter people. Um, what area do you sort of, the main guts of your research has been? And um, so I've worked on a, on a few areas in the past, I guess also on foundations, on quantum thermodynamics, on quantum crypto. I should say what interests me most right now, um, even though not exclusively, is uh, I guess quantum networks. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm also part of the quantum internet team at QTech, uh, where we actually, I guess, try to realize such a network. <laughs> but um, so I suppose I'm going to sort of jump ahead a little bit because I'd probably and it is related to networking, certainly the hardware, um, is probably the most high profile of your results in the last 12 months is uh, this loophole-free bell test. Um, yes, generally, yeah. don't jump into this so quickly, but uh, since it's garnered so much attention and how it's so fun foundational to quantum mechanics and quantum technology, I don't know, can you give us sort of a run through of what this is? Um, you like uh, what a bell test is or why it's important? Yeah, so uh, basically what this experiment why did we, well, why did you guys do it? Um, and what this implies in sort of tests of fundamental quantum mechanics and therefore how it's related to, to communications and network security. Yeah, so a bell test is actually very beautiful in the sense that it's two things. It's very fundamental, but it also has kind of very interesting cryptographic implications. So you can kind of think that um, if you would think that nature is classical and you would make a measurement, maybe it's like opening the page of a book. Like I want to measure the position of a particle. I don't know that yet. I make a measurement. I look and I find, I don't know, on page five, it says particle is at three meters from the wall. Mm -hmm. So the kind of question is sort of whether nature really works like that in the sense that the result of every measurement is in fact already known. It's kind of already classical. It's written on some page, but I haven't seen the page yet. So I have to make a measurement to, to find out. And so these kind of pages are known as hidden variables kind of in physics. 
Mm -hmm. and, and the question is sort of, is nature described by hidden variables? Is kind of everything already written, but we just have to measure to find out. So a Bell test is kind of uh, cool because actually it shows you that nature does not work like that. Uh, so one guess one can kind of calculate if one does an um, experiment between space-like separated sites with sites which are separated, and they are separated so they don't, cannot talk to each other during the course of the experiment. And then one can observe certain correlations, um, how they are, well are they coordinated between the two sites, mm -hmm. which are um, much stronger quantumly than any classical description would allow. So this space-like separation, I mean, the whole idea of this is that you separate these things far enough away and you do things in a short enough time frame that even light can't get from point A to point B in that time frame, right? Exactly. So you can kind of actually think that there's kind of two persons, if you want. It's called an Alice and Bob. Mm -hmm. In the experiment in Delft, um, Alice is located uh, three floors roughly down from where I'm sitting right now. And Bob is roughly 1.3 kilometers a bit further away. In fact, in some lab, like close to a nuclear re test reactor here in, in Delft. That doesn't affect anything? <laughs> well, no, not really. <laughs> 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 well, we hope not, but uh, I mean, actually the conclusions, I guess, are valid even if it would have affected it, because I'll get to that maybe in a moment. Um, so, uh, uh, and you can kind of think that we're going to pose Alice and Bob questions, meaning that they have to make one of two possible measurements, and they have to give us an answer in a time frame that is shorter than kind of light or information takes to travel from Alice to Bob. So this is why they're um, 1.3 kilometers apart. So this is all predicated, obviously, and the, and the assumption that nothing can travel faster than light, even information. That's right. So, so do these yeah. Bell tests, um, do they have any implications if relativity is wrong? So, of course, like, uh, uh, if kind of you could communicate faster than, I guess, the current speed of light, um, then uh, uh, one could not draw the same conclusion from this kind of experiment. Mm -hmm. Like, if there exists some kind of limit, kind of some maximum speed at which information you could travel. You could always, of course, do such a test by spacing them possibly further apart in their yeah. life. Um, but you have to make such an assumption. There's actually two other important assumptions that kind of go into a Bell test, uh, in the sense that, uh, so I just said that we're going to ask Alice and Bob some questions. Mm -hmm. and they have to be randomly chosen, because you can kind of think if we don't choose them randomly, then there's no point even in limiting the time that it takes to communicate. In fact, Bob already knows what we're going to ask Alice. Um, so this is kind of why we have to choose them randomly. And the question is, where does this randomness come from? Mm -hmm. So if, uh, kind of, if you don't believe that uh, randomness exists in nature, but everything is super determined, so to say, until the beginning of the universe, then one can also not draw any conclusions from a Bell test. Right. Um, of course, you can ask yourself if everything is super determined, maybe you should not worry about this because you're already determined to not worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you get down the philosophical rabbit hole if you go down that. Yeah, so there's no way, in fact, no t test that one can perform to find out whether, whether that would be true, whether everything is already determined ahead of time. Uh, there is one other important assumption, um, which is, relates to not the kind of questions, but the answers. Mm -hmm. So I said that Alice and Bob have to give us an answer in a time frame that is shorter than it takes information to travel from Alice to Bob. But of course, you can ask yourself, what does it mean to give an answer? Mm -hmm. So this kind of means that I give a classical answer that can be recorded, say, on a hard drive or on a computer. But of course, you might think that also my hard drive might be quantum or not classical, and maybe it can still be changed at a later point in time when the information finally can arrive from the other side. So we're trying, so, so I suppose that there's two things. There's the Bell test, which um, was done back in the 80s, right? The first version, or was it the 90s? I can't remember. Yeah, so there's been several Bell tests. And of course, all previous ones had, I guess, one of two possible loopholes. So a loophole means that there's another assumption that one has to make. Mm -hmm. um, so, there's, I guess, two main loopholes. One of them is called the locality loophole, which means that Alice and Bob are too close together, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, they actually would have, in principle, had time to communicate. Um, uh, 
within uh, before basically um, giving the answer. Mm -hmm. The other one is called the detection loophole. And you can think that what this means is that, um, you know, sometimes the kind of a photon gets lost or there's no detection event, which means that in the game that we're going to play, instead of giving an answer, they can say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can easily think that kind of you can tweak how well you can win this game if every time I don't like the question, I just say, I don't know. Um, right. uh, so, 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 I mean, the, the, so I, I suppose this is the distinction. There's the bell test and, and then these loopholes. There's mm -hmm. Alice and Bob being too close together or this detection loophole. What, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're trying to do is design an experiment that nature can't cheat it. So we don't know what nature can do and what nature can't do, but we want to try to restrict nature as much as possible so that they can't cheat. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so and in your, sorry. Yeah. So it's actually very difficult to close both of these loopholes at the same time, because you can kind of think that, I guess, to create entanglement, for example, over longer distances becomes harder and harder and harder. So let's say that I don't know, a photon travels around um, to kind of create entanglement. Um, if it gets lost, I give them the opportunity to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but at the same time, kind of the longer I make the distance, the easier it is to get for the photon to get lost. So I want them to be kind of far apart, but at the same time, the further I put them apart, the kind of the, get the, lost. The, you know, don't know scenario becomes more and more likely. So it's kind of the challenge is to combine both of these demands. Um, so, I mean, this is this has turned into a bit of a spectacular result because it, it's sort of the quintessential test of quantumness, right? The, the quantum theory isn't missing anything. So Einstein is famously or was always very skeptical of quantum theory as being a fundamental description of reality and, and the Bell test or a loophole free Bell test um, is sort of the, the last nail in the coffin on that. Uh, that viewpoint that quantum mechanics does seem to be an accurate representation of, of how things behave at the atomic scale. Yes, so of course, like I said, if you believe in, uh, in uh, that there is a maximum speed of light, which ironically, I guess, if you do believe in Einstein's special relativity, <laughs> um, uh, then indeed, like you can draw such conclusions. And this is like, it's very, it's like, it's very exciting, I guess, that this has now been done. I guess it's the final, final nail in the coffin, as you put it. Because it's not just, I mean, you guys were the first, but there's now like four or five of these experiments. Yes, there's a, there's a few more, like uh, one of them, one or two of them uh, not too long after ours, I think, uh, maybe roughly uh, from, I guess, when the paper appeared on the archive, roughly two months later. Mm -hmm. Of course, the data was available a bit earlier. Um, uh, and now there's another experiment uh, of the group of Harald Weinfurter in Munich. Uh, you've maybe, maybe seen it on Twitter. It's very cool, actually. So you could kind of follow the follow the experiment on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I saw a link from a conference that yes, they're collecting data in real time, and you can see the data as it's coming in. Yeah, so I guess it's con been confirmed now um, uh, that indeed, kind of, uh, nature is not classical. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So to sort of leapfrog now for, from this sort of experiment into sort of what's happening in, in Delft and in the Netherlands. Um, this experiment was done using diamond technology, is that correct? Yes, right, yeah. So is this, so sort of give us an overview of what's happening at Delft, because it's quite a big effort now. The Dutch government's putting quite a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. You've got investment from Intel. Microsoft, I think, also invests yes. um, within this. And, and you've now spun off. Um, there's obviously the, the effort is concentrated at Delft, but now there are sort of private sort of, pseudo private public companies that have been set up what is it Qtech and and various things so maybe give us a bit of an overview of a quite a large effort in otherwise a comparatively small country <laughs> yeah so like uh, let me maybe kind of move up zoom out from the from the bell experiment sort of slowly mm -hmm. um so i guess the bell experiment i guess was kind of a, uh, was, uh, an effort of the quantum internet team at Qtech and i guess using the kind of same uh, diamond technology we now actually want to build like a quantum internet in the Netherlands, I guess eventually a larger one, that we aim to set up a demonstration network within the next five years, or I guess roughly four and a half now, um, on, uh, that will connect some Dutch cities. So this will connect Delft, Leiden, The Hague, and probably Amsterdam. 
uh, where we kind of want to demonstrate the technology of a quantum repeater. Mm -hmm. So one of the, I guess, goals of, of QTAC is to kind of realize a quantum internet, like a, eventually like a large scale quantum network. Uh, so I guess this is kind of one aspect of what mm -hmm. QTAC um, so of it's course, like five or six divisions, isn't there? Yeah, there's there's three. Uh, uh, I guess there's also like a theory which kind of cross connects them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the quantum internet effort. Um, uh, so on the experimental side, this uh, includes uh, Ronald Hansen, Tim Tamiya, and from the theory side myself. And then there's uh, what we call uh, fault tolerant computation. Um, which contains kind of most of the computing efforts, uh, including superconducting qubits and also spin qubits now in silicon. Mm -hmm. uh, so this really aims to build a, I guess, large-scale quantum computer. Uh, and there, there's also a partnership of QTEC with Intel. And I guess the very nice thing about this partnership is actually not just you might say, oh, it's great, you get all this money, but the very <laughs> nice thing about is uh, also that uh, there's really kind of a partnership with Intel in the sense that they can make chips uh, for for QTEC. Uh, so as you can imagine, one kind of challenge in uh, to build a quantum computer is of course to produce the actual devices. Mm -hmm. And you can think that in a university environment, it is very difficult to make, say, I don't know, 500 chips or 1,000 chips, which are all the same. So Intel, of course, is a specialist in, in high producing chips reliably. Um, and there's also Intel engineers here who I guess collaborate um, yeah, to kind of produce kind of chips that will allow, well, hopefully, um, to, I guess, scale the quantum computing efforts uh, significantly in size. So the Intel chips, obviously, Intel's known for the, for the silicon uh, technology that it developed. So is that, is that the only sort of devices that they can fabricate, or are they also involved in the superconducting designs? And um, yeah, so I guess uh, their main primary expertise is in is in silicon. This is, I guess, also uh, what they've mainly been doing so far. There's a few Intel engineers here to sort of learn uh, kind of other technologies. Mm -hmm. So our partner with Intel is not that long, but I expect that we will see actually kind of uh, that they will also, I guess, engage in this activity uh, in, the, in the future. So, I mean... What sort of motivated them to get involved? Um, obviously, I think, what was it, a $50 million investment from Intel? Yeah, so um, I, cannot, I cannot speak for Intel, of course. Of course not, no. <laughs> so I think I can tell you kind of what motivated QTEC to get involved in this. Um, like I said, of course, it's nice to have the finances, but I think one of the primary motivations was really also to have a, I guess, partner um, where one has more of a partnership and they really bring something into this, namely, I guess, the fact that they have kind of fab or have a lot of experience in actually making chips. So what motivated them, I, I would rather not speak for them. <laughs> right, yeah, sure. Hopefully somebody from Intel will have a conversation with us as well and we can delve into why, uh, why they got involved. So your three core technologies are silicon, superconductors and diamond. And diamond is very much regulated to the networking side or are you also looking at building computers out of them? Yeah, so uh, uh, Ronald Hansen is focusing on the on using NV centers in Diamond for uh, building a quantum internet, mm -hmm. and, but Tim Tamino is focusing on uh, using diamonds to do computation. And the so, architectures sort of feed into one another, or are they sort of separate efforts? Uh, so they are not completely separated efforts. Like uh, I mean, that would be very strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of kind of. Uh, uh, collaboration uh, uh, between Tim and Ronald. I can yes. tell you more about this in a moment. Maybe I should tell you that, of course, we also have efforts in kind of topological qubits. Um, uh, uh, I guess current there's efforts to, I guess, actually braid Majoranas. Um, so we'll see how this goes. So these are the actual, so what I call anionic qubits to the, distinguish between that and topological quantum codes. Yeah, um, right. which I do a lot of work on. So, I mean, your team, uh, Delft, is trying to, to create these particles that otherwise have, uh, have eluded us, but are supposed to be extremely robust and extremely good for quantum computers if we can eventually build them. That's right, yeah. So I guess, uh, I guess signatures of these uh, particles, the Majoranas, have already been seen here, actually, in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess to do, I guess... Uh, say, to bring this more to a computation effort or to, I guess, uh, observe more interesting effects, one really has to go and braid them, which I guess is the current um, target of the topological uh, quantum roadmap in the near term, 
uh, at Delft. So, I mean, you've seen signatures of these things in, in 2012. Um, I mean, is there, a, so is the time frame? do you think this development could work over you know, within the year, within the five years? Um, how close I, do you think they are? Uh, <laughs> well, you don't want to speculate. <laughs> Maybe I would not speculate. Um, I'm hoping that it will be faster than five years. So, I mean, do you have any, you know, you being a theorist and sort of putting your fingers in all kinds of pies, I mean, do you have a particular favourite? Do you have a system that you, you think is going to be um, <laughs> successful in the, in, in the short term or, you know, be first past the post? And so I think this kind of depends a little bit on what you focus on. So I think in the kind of internet and computation domain, I guess it's easy because I, 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 I do believe that we can actually do it. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but there's only one system. With the other ones, I do have some <laughs> opinions, I guess. Um, but um, um, uh, I actually try not to kind of uh, uh, make judgments about who of my colleagues, so to say, will succeed. <laughs> oh, well, you, you, you've got to put them on the spot a little bit. <laughs> I mean, we have so, so many different hardware people and, and so many different experimentalists come in and talk, and uh, they all love their own systems. That's right, yes. Mm. But I mean, the, the, the investment and uh, sort of the merging or sort of the outsourcing of, of, of a lot of this stuff moving from sort of the academic sector into the industrial sector um, with investment like from Intel or Google or IBM. I mean, you've been in this business for, for quite a while, um, as, of, as most of us. Uh, do you still do you see this sort of shifting away that it's, it's no longer becoming a purely academic endeavor and that this really is starting to emerge as a... Uh, is at least in in its infancy uh, this new quantum technology sector. Yeah, so I actually think so. I think it's also kind of important to realize, I guess, that um, to really kind of make a quantum computer, like um, uh, I don't think one can succeed wholly in academia. Mm -hmm. Like uh, um, I think actually that QTech is a little bit special. That of course we are in academia, but in some aspects of how we work. Is, I mean, of course, we are not kind of in industry, is um, uh, uh, that we work a little bit more, say, on a focused uh, approach than, say, just some random, I don't know, department at university. Um, so maybe let me explain a little bit what we mean by that. Sure, sure, sure. Oh, I'd like to understand the structure of QTech and how it fits in with Delft and how it makes these links in with the industrial sector. So I think one, one thing that's quite important to understand about QTech is it's not some PIs who kind of gave themselves a the name, say QTech, um, for kind of convenience sake. And now we're doing our thing as we were also always doing. And if you run to each other at the coffee machine, then maybe we end up collaborating. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. <laughs> this is not kind of how QTech operates, but kind of QTech really has quite serious goals, like kind of quantum internet and quantum computation, um, on which we kind of work together. And this, I think, is a commitment um, that I guess all the PIs at QTech have made. Mm -hmm. um, you might you might think that uh, I mean let me put it as somewhat dramatically for someone in university that we've given up part of our academic freedom in order to kind of focus on this focused effort together uh, um, uh, to 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 actually realize this. So within these roadmaps, uh, I guess we we work quite closely together. Um, I guess we share students. Um, uh, and uh, we also have kind of meetings on how, how, how do we plan, what do we need to do in order to accomplish this. And um, we also have quite a, a collaborations, for example, with TNO, which is like a research institute, which is not like university. They could do kind of sort of, if you want, contract research, I'm not quite. Uh, uh, but there's also people from that who kind of help us with certain very specific um, engineering questions. I guess I'm a theorist. I don't. Uh, <laughs> but you don't. Yeah, probably not. Not as much as the experimentalists would. Yeah. So I, of course, also kind of uh, um, like I said, we we kind of do talk together. Like, uh, what do we really have to do in order to realize this? Um, uh, so of course, like I also kind of interact with people that I probably would not not normally kind of interact with. Um, of course, for my experimental colleagues, they do this much more uh, often, um, which is actually very cool. Um, so you can kind of think that like uh, TNO also has, for example, radar engineers who can think about addressing microwave addressing of qubits. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very powerful. Um, because I think in order to succeed, there's really a lot of, say, engineering challenges to be overcome. Um, 
that are, I think, very difficult to overcome in a purely university context. Yes, uh, that's good. Uh, because you, you have to write papers kind of in academia all the time, mm -hmm. whereas you know, some of these engineering efforts, they're super important, they're extremely challenging and mega hard, but they might, I don't know, not result in academic kind of publication. Um, well, I think that I also agree that's an important shift is to get people in whose primary job is not to write grants and not to write papers. Yes, yeah. I think that's the only way, I guess, to succeed. <laughs> well, I think to build active and workable and obviously commercializable technology, I think uh, that's an inevitability. Yeah. Um, you know, cer certainly, you know, Intel or Microsoft or that, they, they, they don't have the metrics of how many papers have you published in the last month. Yes. <laughs> or, I shouldn't say last month. If people are publishing more than a few papers a month, they're doing pretty well. Yeah. So, of course, you, sorry. So, of course, like on the academic side, of course, we have to pay attention to that because you know we have PhD students and so on. Of course, we want mm -hmm. them to succeed and become great researchers. Um, so, kind of QTEC is a very say interesting mix. Uh, um, so, I mean, is QTEC? I mean, is it sort of like? I don't know, the, the Center for Quantum Computing Technology in Australia, it's, sort of, it's a name that's attached to an academic effort, or is it more like a spin-off company, or is it sort of half and half? Um, so QTEC is, um, at present, um, I guess, a, a kind of shared venture between TU Delft, the university, mm -hmm. and TNO. Um, and this, we are located on the campus of, uh, of TU Delft. Um, and there's people here who are officially employed both by Delft and TNO, but we are all in the same place. Um, here kind of at QTEC and so we're currently not a kind of separate venture um, and this may sort of change over time and there's actually some debate whether QTEC becomes in the department and then there's some spin-off QTEC industries um, uh, kind of that is sort of under the QTEC umbrella um, but this is currently being discussed like uh, uh, how this exactly would work like whether um, say efforts which are then kind of geared towards industrialization are placed into QTEC industries, which is sort of, I don't know, they're there together, or whether the umbrella of QTEC, that's, I mean, we're currently actually talking about it. <laughs> There's no resolution. So it's, a, it's, a, it's another one. So the, the last conversation that we had on YouTube was with the students from the, the CDT at the University of Bristol. And you know, the University of Bristol's got a, a doctoral training center. It's got the Center for Quantum Photonics, which is sort of their hardware arm. Um, they've got this QE tech, which is sort of their industrial linkage thing. Um, so the Dutch and Delft are, are slowly trying to build a similar infrastructure. Um, yeah, so of course, we have all kinds of connections with industry together. I mean, like, you know, we partner with Intel and Microsoft. We have a lot of uh, connections to the Dutch industry. For example, like the KPN, which is the Dutch Telecom, will also give us fibers for this kind of quantum internet demonstrator. Um, but currently, this is kind of within QTEC. So I guess in order to enlarge these efforts, um, which we already have, of course, uh, there's a question whether we will give this a separate name and kind of make this a larger activity. But so, of course, we already have these. There's a, a roadmap in within QTEC called Shared Development, um, which basically currently kind of encompasses such efforts. So uh, getting back to sort of the technology and the hardware that you're developing. Um, so you've mentioned uh, the fault tolerant quantum computing program, the topological, the anionic. Uh, program, but are they separate things, or is the fault tolerant program? So yeah, so of course, like uh, maybe this is like not the most uh, greatest thing. <laughs> so of course, like topological quantum computation is also fault tolerant. Yeah, um, um, but for various reasons, we have kind of the topological roadmap, the fault tolerant uh, computation roadmap, and the I guess um, quantum internet roadmap or quantum internet and network computation. So, uh, so your fault tolerant program is the top of, is the error corrected model, and then you've got exactly. a separate one on anionic quantum computing. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, with all three of these programs, so you're talking about sort of your roadmap and where you think each well, where Delft thinks in general, uh, these three programs are headed, say, in five years. I mean, what are sort of your your short term milestones in terms of demonstrable technology? So, like I said, in the quantum internet regime, like we really try to um, uh, demonstrate like a repeater technology within, like I said, four and a half years now. Um, this will be challenging. We're so far on track, so I'm kind of happy about that. So, would and this be a, a one hop repeater? So, sort of two links 
a middle station and then you do an entanglement swapping and get a longer connection or is it a more complicated Yes, so like I guess, you know, I like guess, um, of course, in the lab, one could make larger structures if you want to demonstrate it in the, I guess, outside. Mm -hmm. um, kind of every node is kind of very expensive, so we're trying to have like a four node network. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's not fully connected, so it's kind of nice. It's um, um, kind of a first demonstration out outside the kind of lab. And then, so the whole thing would be you, you try and build a, a like a, a sort of a ring back onto itself with entanglement. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So it is essentially has kind of a ring shape. And of course, we aim to create end-to-end -end entanglement between any of these four nodes. And that's within the next five years? Hopefully, yes. Hopefully, okay. And what are, the, what are the milestones for more of the, the computational uh, area? Yeah, so um, like for example, for the superconducting efforts, like Leo Di Carlo is aiming to have 49 qubits, like seven by seven. Mm -hmm. um, within the next, I guess, uh, also four and a half years now, so I'm counting back from kind of five. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, with the kind of spin qubit, like, uh, um, I guess development might um, go a bit slower, um, but there's no kind of fixed number. There are some discussions actually to de kind of build a sort of larger device um, out of spin qubits, which is possibly not a full quantum computer, um, which might nevertheless, uh, I don't know, be interesting for sort of limited, like not universal quantum computations. So are these, these are silicon spin qubits, are they they're quantum dots or are they like um, single atom impurities? They're, they're, they're quantum dots. They're quantum dots. Okay, so that technology is obviously a, a lot more further down the road than say yeah. superconductors or, or iron traps. So I try and I, I'm impartial. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. That's absolutely fair enough. <laughs> and you, you also have a bit of a software effort as well, from what I understand. Yeah, that's right. So, like, uh, um, um, there's a uh, um, uh, micro peer, of course. So like, uh, there's also another theory person uh, joining us uh, next spring. Um, um, I guess it's not completely done yet, even though we have an official, uh, inofficial kind of uh, confirmation. So, maybe I don't want to mention the name yet. No, no, no uh, that's all right. <laughs> even though I uh, you know this person. Um, so I guess in my group, like, uh, like, like I said, I work a lot kind of with, uh, with Walmart in the quantum internet domain, both on the more low level questions in quantum networks, as well as the high level questions. Um, we also kind of look for new applications actually for both kind of uh, the quantum network and also, I guess, uh, the computing efforts. There's some collaborations also, for example, with the physics group in Leiden of Carlo Wienerker. Um, to say search for applications for kind of small um, quantum devices. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of very helpful because I guess um, um, they really come from kind of a very physical perspective. So it's kind of interesting to kind of bring uh, this uh, uh, kind of knowledge uh, in, into QTEC. Um, like uh, our new theory person um, has worked a lot on fault tolerant uh, computation. Mm -hmm. and, um, also error correction. So I guess from the software side, we will also expand a little bit beyond that, but that's also I guess, not quite clear. So I guess we like um, I guess you might see kind of more software or, or theory kind of on the on in QTech, both on the kind of more abstract level, like I don't know what are applications of small quantum computers or mm -hmm. quantum networks, kind of how do we make kind of the real error correcting codes. Um, uh, all the way down to people who kind of more do more hardware type theory. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some other theory people, in fact, who are kind of more hardware type theory. For example, Michael Wimmer, who works in the topological roadmap, and uh, also Slava Dobrowitsky, who will work on in the kind of, uh, um, yeah, I guess, mainly in the quantum internet roadmap, and who has a lot of experience with NV centers in Diamond. Um, so I think I think one of the kind of nice things also I guess about QTech is uh, that we don't see these kind of as separated activities, um, but the effort is really I guess like I said we have maybe made the collective decision to resign part of our our academic freedom in order to achieve these kind of goals. Um, so this is I guess why uh, 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 like both ways of course like we work with the people who do experiments I guess for, I don't know. 
uh, motivate them to implement certain things. <laughs> well, you give it, you give them good ideas and say that this would be yeah. a wonderful thing if you could demonstrate. Exactly, mm -hmm. but of, it also works a lot the other way around. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, maybe if I can offer a sort mm -hmm. of a maybe personal opinion, actually, or perspective on that, mm -hmm. um, that uh, to some extent, doing uh, pure theory is very easy. You know, I can uh, I can prove a theorem, and I can mm -hmm. say my theorem only applies, you know, if m is larger than twenty and k is smaller than three, or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Some parameter regime, um, where I've just managed to prove my my theorem. Um, so this is, I guess. Uh, to some extent easier because you have much more freedom you know if i cannot prove exactly that i would rather prove this and, and it would still be kind of interesting to kind of really make something happen is really very challenging um and uh, i find this rather inspiring in fact to be to be at qtech i've learned a lot of things since i'm here uh, i mean you, you originally came well your, your previous academic appointment was at uh, the national university of singapore with the center for quantum technology down there i mean was it, was it a sort of a natural flow for you to go back to the Netherlands or, you know, has, has your research really had to adapt to sort of, as you said, this, this sort of collective agreement on, uh, on what you now want to do? So I should say that I, this is why I came here. So I did not come here because I wanted to return to the Netherlands because I studied <laughs> And um, this is, uh, I would like to emphasize that this is definitely not the case. Mm -hmm. um, the Netherlands is a very rainy place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's much more sunny and, and beautiful. And uh, uh, I've also had the opportunity to, I guess, go to Europe actually on various occasions. Um, and I've never done that. Uh, so I really came here specifically, in fact, for that. Um, uh, because I find it quite exciting. Because you know, of course, like uh, I'm having a lot of fun, kind of with theory. But one of I, I, one of the reasons, I guess, why I work on quantum information, is because I think it can actually be done. Uh, but somehow you cannot do that alone. Uh, like my, like I said, it's better if you don't touch anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, theorists um, like us cannot build this stuff. No, no, that's clear. But it's very kind of fun, actually, and I very much enjoy it, sort of. Um, and to have kind of the opportunity to to kind of work together, so one might actually realize this. So I mean, I I've been asking everyone who, who's done a, a podcast with me, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try and nail you down for any predictions like I have uh, with other people, even though there is a a user specified bottle of whiskey for anyone who gets as close as they can in the next five years to a solid prediction. But instead of asking you um, for a prediction of the general field, um, I'd rather ask you, in the context of your own work or your own division's work on the quantum internet, what do you think, or what would you like to see happen in the real long term? I do. What do you see as the applications for a quantum internet um, in the same way that, uh, you know, we have the classical internet now? Is it to link together quantum computers? Why would we want to be able to do that? Um, Maybe give me sort of what your aspirational views are specifically for quantum networks. Yeah, so I can, I guess, uh, I guess you're asking like, what is it good for? Um, sort of. So, uh, so, like, I guess the, the kind of, uh, in principle, a quantum internet can kind of create entanglement between any two nodes in a network um, and followed by any applications that follow from that. So this can be both in the kind of cryptographic domain um, I guess quantum key distribution is very well known, even though I guess it's only one application. And there's many other quantum crypto protocols. There's actually quite a lot of protocols for synchronization in the network, for example, clocks, but there's also um, protocols that kind of use um, entanglement uh, to sort of synchronize problems in distributed systems. Mm -hmm. You can kind of think that kind of entanglement is kind of very correlated. It creates correlations which are much stronger than is possible classically. And this is kind of why it's kind of useful for synchronization problems. Um, people have used, I guess, uh, uh, there's even some proposal to use, uh, I guess, quantum uh, communication to extend the baseline of telescopes. I don't know how interesting this is to us. Okay. Um, uh, there's even proposals to use, uh, I guess, uh, entanglement to cheat at bridge games. Um, I'm not, this is not a very serious proposal. At bridge games? Well, <laughs> you, you never know what applications could flow from that. Yeah, so I think actually maybe to give you some perspective on, on quantum internet and both computation in um, in how I see things in evolve a little bit also with the, the with respect to how applications are developed so I think a lot of the kind of application development so far um, has been rather I mean it has been 
there was no device, right? So like mm -hmm. basically, if you design a quantum algorithm, then you have to prove that it kind of works, right? You have to prove mathematically that there's some kind of classical speed up. So if you look at kind of algorithms, say in classical computer science, this, of course, a lot of algorithms one can view, prove great properties, but quite often these things are heuristic. For example, if you want to make an algorithm that recognizes faces, mm -hmm. um, there's usually no proof that it can recognize a face, um, but you kind of try it out on 1,000 faces and it seems to work great. Um, so I think like both in the kind of development towards say applications for a quantum internet as well as in fact the applications of possibly even small scale quantum computers, I think there will be kind of a development where there will be much more heuristic development because you can try it out. Like you actually have a small scale quantum internet or you actually have a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and you can kind of see how it works basically there. I think there will be a expansion. In fact, if I can make a prediction. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so I guess currently, like if you look at theory, quantum information, um, there's, uh, um, <clears throat> I guess in the physics domain, there's a lot of it is say mathematical physics. Um, and of course not all of it, there's also a lot of applied things. And um, then in the computer science domain, most of it belongs to theoretical computer science. Um, but of course, these like see, theoretical computer science or mathematical physics is a tiny corner in, uh, in, in physics or computer science. Um, so I think actually that in parallel to experimental efforts, there will be a rather large expansion, I think, especially maybe also in the computer science domain of, let me call it applied quantum computer science. Um, That's probably so, not a bad name for it. Uh, uh, which doesn't, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a bit of it now, but uh, but I somehow think, think that we will see a lot of this kind of in the future, so the small devices become available and you can see what happens with them, basically. So you um, think uh, you think that a quantum internet, at least it, at the moment, do, do you envisage sort of a, a, a replacement of classical technology with quantum? So we will have quantum computers instead of classical computers and a quantum net internet instead of a classical internet, rather than whether it's a quantum computer or a quantum network, um, augmenting the current classical system? So I would say augmenting. So um, uh, in a kind of, I don't think the classic, I mean, the classical internet will not be replaced. It's very useful to do classical communication. So mm -hmm. what we're doing now, for example, does not have to be quantum, right? There's no reason why. Um, uh, not that I can think of, but if you had asked me uh, 20 years ago, would we even be doing this? Yeah, indeed. So that's a good question. So I think I think it's actually very beautiful to think that, like, uh, if you would have, uh, uh, say, quantum internet in your house, um, uh, you could play around with it, and, and uh, I think people would find many interesting applications by actually yeah. purpose. <laughs> no, I com I completely agree with you. Uh, you know, the the idea that the, the physicists and the the complexity theorists are the ones who are going to find the killer app. I I also think is a bit of a a, a silly idea. I think. Once people, you know, the hacking community or some nine-year-old kid sitting on his computer at home gets access to these things and gets access to, to very powerful yeah. um, small-scale quantum processes, we'll start seeing some interesting things. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very kind of optimistic about that. Like, I think it would be cool. Like, uh, also with a computer, I think you will have a quantum processor next to a classical one. And I actually sort of hope that... Uh, this will also become available even even to kids who will, or, or I guess uh, uh, <clears throat> people in the future or maybe you know like if there's learn programming they can immediately learn to help program a small quantum people. Well, I mean the IBM effort with their their quantum experience seems to be taking the first tentative steps towards this. Yeah, so I actually find this very cool, and one thing that I find especially exciting or makes me kind of hopeful that kind of. By playing around, people can discover kind of great new kind of algorithms. Basically, is that if you kind of look around on the internet, where people discuss the IBM quantum experience, like people who are not really in the field, they play mm -hmm. around. They have like realized that one of these fields is much worse than the other ones. Um, <laughs> so they debate this and kind of work around it and and find solutions to it. Uh, and I think that's great. I and mean, I think if kind of these devices are available, then, then then we will see a lot more of them. Yeah, I think I saw a language interface written by a, a, I think she's a climatologist. She's down at the South Pole or something. 
Oh yeah, actually, I haven't I haven't read it, but I saw it, I saw it actually on Twitter, but I haven't I haven't read it. Yeah, everyone downloaded it, and then we saw the affiliation, and it was sort of okay. This is definitely a first <laughs> um, in our field. Either that, or I, I don't know. Maybe the I suppose it's the South Pole, so at the moment the the nights must be quite long. <laughs> Probably. <yeah. laughs> So we've hit about our 45 minutes, which is generally how long I, I like to try and keep these things going. But uh, at the end of, of each discussion, I, I do g give the interviewee uh, an opportunity to, to advertise or plug or, or just announce anything that's interesting that's happening now or happening in, in the short term. Yeah, so I guess I guess I wanted to make uh, a few plugs. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's actually dark, by the way, at the South Pole. It's uh, winter, right? But it's no winter, way. yeah. So I think it's long nights at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess there's three shameless plugs that I want to make. <laughs> and the first one is, I guess, for our education effort. Um, so I guess in QTech, we also have QTech Academy. So you can kind of find it on our website. <clears throat> so this is, I guess, a program for master students, where in the first uh, year, there's kind of a series of classes. And in the second year, there's options to do a master project at QTech. Um, so uh, <clears throat> this is open actually to students from both engineering and physics and computer science. Um, so it's, it's quite exciting. Yeah, well, I'll definitely put a link to that in, in the description mm -hmm. of both the podcast episode and the YouTube clip. So if people want to click on and, and see what's going on, they can do so. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, uh, yes, so, that's, so I'm actually teaching an online class online on edX, which is called Cube Crypto X. That will start on the 10th of October. Um, we will actually assume that the kind of people already know what is a qubit. If, if someone does not know what is a qubit, <coughs> they can start a week early. So mm -hmm. We have like a free program to kind of teach you what a qubit is. Um, so, yes. So, edX, that's run out of Caltech, mm -hmm. is that correct? Uh, so, edX is a separate platform, mm -hmm. uh, so, um, like Coursera. And uh, so this is a joint venture actually between uh, QTech here in Delft and IQIM at Caltech. Mm -hmm. So this class is jointly taught with Thomas uh, Wiedig and myself. Uh, so indeed, mark the 10th of October. Yes. Uh, there's one more shameless part that I have. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so I guess you know that kind of there's a large, I guess, a theory conference in quantum information called QIP. So QIP will actually be in Delft in 2018. So come to Delft, maybe sooner than uh, QIP 2018. <laughs> I have I have not been to Delft yet, and I don't think I've even been to a QIP. So that could be two birds with one stone. Yeah, maybe you should visit a bit earlier. It's a long time in the future, but um, yeah. <laughs> but yes. Okay, well, uh, thanks again, Stephanie, for joining us today. And uh, I'll put uh, all the relevant links to, to what you've plugged and uh, your website and your Twitter account for people who, who want to keep following uh, what's going on uh, with you and what's going on with Delft. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, uh, thanks for taking an hour out of your day and sitting down and having a chat. Yeah, thanks for organizing, Simon. No problem. <laughs> So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And uh, this podcast will be uploaded to iTunes and SoundCloud pretty shortly, hopefully within the next day. Um, I apologize uh, for our last discussion with the, the students from Bristol. Uh, unfortunately, I'm still trying to clean up the audio. Um, it's taken quite a long time. Uh, hopefully, it'll be in a usable form, and I can re-upload the YouTube video and, and upload the podcast uh, with a bit of uh, a little bit of work done on the audio to make it a, a bit easier to, to hear what they're saying. So thanks for those who joined in and thanks for those who have listened offline. Cheers. Oh, great. <laughs>